Good morning. My name is Brad High, and I'm the pastor at Calvary Baptist Church here in Elk City. We want to thank you for tuning in this morning to watch our preaching service. We're not able to meet together yet because of the virus that's still going on. We're still taking precautions here at our church, and so we, we really do miss that opportunity to meet together. So church family, I want you to know I love you, and we are praying for you. And if you need anything, please reach out to us. I also want to let you know that if you're watching and you're not from Calvary Baptist Church, we want to thank you too for watching. And if you're from our area, we'd love for you to come by and visit us at our church whenever we're able to start meeting again for church. Uh, we have services on Sunday starting at 10 o'clock for our Sunday school and 11 o'clock for our worship. We'd love for you to come out uh, to be a part of our church service. And if you maybe sit at home and you're watching the service, we're thankful that you're doing that. But we want to encourage you as well. Find a good church to go to because you cannot beat the opportunity to be able to sit in the house of God, to worship together, and to be around other fellow believers. I want to encourage you, don't just stay home on Sundays. When this uh, uh, time of the virus is over, find a church to go to and make it your home. Be there, get plugged in and serve. This will never replace, ever replace the opportunity we have given to us by God to come together as a church family. So I want to encourage you, find a church home, and we'd love for you to come check Calvary out, maybe to be your church home. At this time, go ahead and take your Bible and go to Mark chapter number 14. Mark chapter number 14. <clears throat> we are going to continue uh, what our normal services here are at Calvary with preaching through the book of Mark. We've been doing that now for some time, and last week we went ahead and we took some time off. I felt like the Lord wanted to maybe take that time to just encourage uh, people during everything that was going on, and it still is going on, but I, I really feel like we need to get back on track, and I feel like the Lord has led us to get back into the book of Mark because we do not know if we're going to be able to meet on Easter or not. But what we do know is that we want to still continue the series because right now we're right at the time of the crucifixion and on Easter Sunday we'll be at the resurrection so we're still going to preach through this leading into Easter and if we cannot be together here on Easter Sunday we'll still preach that message on that Sunday but we want you to know that the next Sunday that we are together that's when we're going to celebrate and we can't wait for that time we're looking so forward to it but Mark chapter 14 is where we're finding ourselves and we uh we find ourselves in a time where Jesus is coming uh, to be arrested. And he's been in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been praying. Judas has come and given him that kiss on the cheek to betray him. The, the, the hundreds of soldiers have come to arrest him. And now he's being brought before the high priest for his charges. And so I want to start reading there in verse number 53, Mark chapter 14, Verse 53, it says this. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And Peter followed him afar off, even unto the place of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. And found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there rose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, 
What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him, to cover his face, to buffet him and say unto him, Prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palm of their hands. I'm going to go to the Lord and ask him to just bless this time of preaching and his word. And it's quite the story that we're beginning to read and unfold here. So let's go to the Lord and ask him to open up our hearts to let the word of God speak to us and then pray for what's going on in our country. God, we thank you for the day that you have given us for another opportunity to tune in online. Thank you for the technology that we have to be able to still hear your word preached. And Lord, I do ask that you would speak to hearts this morning, that you'd open up the word. Uh, as we open up the word, that you'd open the hearts to receive the word. God, we are praying for those in our, our country that are sick. We're praying for those uh, that are uh, fighting the battle with the, in the hospital, uh, trying to help keep people well, and uh, those that are separated because of the, the social distancing. And Lord, I just ask that you would be with each of them, give them a strength and comfort that they need at this time. Lord, we love you, and we ask that once again that you would uh, speak to us through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Back in September of 2006, uh, there was an Army officer, a Navy SEAL officer, rather, whose name was Mikey Monsoor. Now, I, I've been reading a book. I love reading. I love history. I, I love reading uh, just about our military and things of that nature. I just lo I love reading. But I, I've been listening to a book. Uh, it's been on leadership, uh, but the story of officer, Petty Officer Mike Monsoor came out in the book. And I've known the story for quite some time, but as I was reading it again and just reading the after-action report, it's it's very it's very moving what Mikey Monsoor did. They, they were on a rooftop and they were being shot at by enemy fire and and there was a grenade that was thrown and it, it eventually hit him what it says in the chest and it fell in front of him. And it was like he was blocking the way for the rest of the people on the rooftop to get away. And so that blast was going to either injure or kill several of his friends that were on that rooftop with him. And instead of where he had one of the only ways out to, to actually leave, instead of doing that, he yelled grenade, alerting his teammates of the danger. And what he did was without hesitation, the report says, and showing no regard to his own life, he threw himself on the grenade, smothering it to protect his teammates, who were lying in close proximity. The grenade detonated as he came down on top of it, mortally wounding him. Then the after action report goes on to say this. Petty Officer Monsoor's actions could not have been more selflessly or clearly intentional. More selfless or clearly intentional of the three seals on that rooftop corner, he had the only avenue of escape away from the blast. And if he had chosen, he could have easily escaped. Instead, Monsoor chose to protect his comrades by the sacrifice of his own life. By his courageous and selfless actions, he saved the lives of his two fellow seals. And it is my it is most deserving of the special recognition afforded by awarding the Medal of Honor. Petty Officer Mike Mansour did win the Medal of Honor, and he did die of his wounds that day. The phrase that stuck out to me in that report was this, is that his actions could not be more selfless or clearly intentional. And I believe that if we read the story that we have before us, and the title of the message even for this message is this, Selfless and Clearly Intentional. Selfless and Clearly Intentional. You know, the, the thing that we look at the story, and we could start off and say that 
all of this was an injustice. The way that everything plays out in Mark chapter 14, verses 53 through 65, is an injustice to Jesus. The court systems were injustice. It was an unfair trial. Everything about it is bad. Everything about it is against the way that they should have been doing this. And yet they went ahead anyway. We could, we could look at it and even say from their point of view, it's almost like we caught Jesus. Let's expedite this trial. Let's kill him so he's out of our hair. And now we've got him. We've got him right where we want him. Look what we have accomplished. The thing that we see about this is that from the time that they go to arrest Jesus in the garden... They bring a multitude of guards and people with them. And it's interesting, in other gospel accounts, they ask, Are you him? Are you Jesus? And he says, I am he. And it says that at that moment, they fell down as if they were dead. I think that they, they brought so many people because they understood there's something different about this guy. We, we can't quite place it, but we do know this. There's some power there, so we're going to lock him down. We're going to take him away, and we'll kill him, and we are in control of this situation. Ha, we got Jesus. And nothing could have been further from the truth, but that was their intention. As a matter of fact, if you think about the things that were listed in the Mosaic Law of how they were supposed to do their trials as Jewish people, there are several things that they broke as far as the rules and regulations that they were to follow. You see, the justice system was governed by rules of evidence and also impartiality. In other words, you weren't supposed to have an opinion on the matter, but rather follow the, the proof, much like what our judicial system is supposed to be like. But they also gathered this from the Mosaic Law, that we find in Deuteronomy. Now we could go there and spend a lot of time in time there in Deuteronomy, but I don't, I don't want to go and spend all that time there. But needless to say, there's several things that they actually neglect to do that was established for trials to be run as to be fair and even merciful. But what they did to Jesus was not fair. They were looking to control the situation. They were looking to control the verdict. They were looking to control the outcome. They had one thing on their mind. Get rid of Jesus at any cost, at any breaking of the rules. Let's get rid of him. The first thing that we see that they actually did to break some of those rules is in verse 53 through 55, we see that they held a nighttime trial. It says, they led Jesus away to the high priest and were assembled the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And it says that Peter followed afar off and they were all warming themselves by the fire. And it, at this time, we understand that he had been praying in the garden of Gethsemane and another gospel says they led him away by night. You see, the, one of the big things about these verses and everything that's beginning to happen in this trial is that it's happening at nighttime. Now, maybe not a big deal, but... In their customs, that was not the way it was supposed to be. They had to go wake up the high priest. They had to go wake up this man named Caiaphas and bring him there and gather everybody together. But that's not the way this trial was supposed to be run. It was supposed to be the next day and even later into the day to give time to gather the evidence and gather things together to be able to put forth an actual arraignment of Jesus. So the first thing that they did is they neglected the, the, the law or the tradition or the principles of holding a daytime trial. Though they expedited this one in the middle of the night. They also probably didn't want very many witnesses to see what had happened. Verse number 55 is really telling of their motive. It says in verse 55, And the chief priests and all the council sought for witnesses, or they were looking for witnesses against Jesus. So notice this, they've arrested him. Now I'm going to look for witnesses to, to prove him wrong. Notice what it says at the very end. For witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Now notice this, they have established a verdict and a sentence before any charge was actually given or before any testimony was even testified in court. In other words, they had already condemned this man to death and they were trying to figure out a way to make it look legal. 
But notice what it says. When they looked for witnesses at the end, they found none. That was the next thing they did. They went searching for a witness that would actually give a story that would support their verdict and sentence of death. What's interesting, though, it says, For many bear false witness against him, but their witnesses agreed not together. In other words, as they, they came together to bear false witness against him, they couldn't come up with a same story among them. So in other words, one would tell one story, another would tell I mean, a similar story, but not exactly the same. So their stories would not match and that could not be used. Well, verse 57 says that there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, I heard him say that he will destroy the temple and he'll build another one with no hands. But it says in verse 59, neither so did their witnesses agree together. Even they had the same story, but they couldn't get all the facts straight together. And basically, they could not submit that in court because it would not hold up. So at this time, they have been trying to get the witnesses to come at Christ to prove that he was guilty without him saying a word. Now, Jesus is hearing all of this, and he hasn't said a word. But that's also something that was breaking of their tradition and what they did in the court system. They were supposed to have somebody there to actually represent Jesus, to speak on Jesus' behalf, but nobody was assigned, nobody was given. So there's no defense that was actually offered. As a matter of fact, they, they would say in verse 63, after he did speak, why do we need any more witnesses? There was not a single chance to really defend himself through somebody to stand in his defense. Some other things that we see that are happening here that are not necessarily listed in the scriptures, but we could make a point of reference is that this is a time of a ceremonial feast. And by their laws and traditions, they were not supposed to be having court during that time. This was the feast of the Passover. They should have waited until those feasts were over to have trial, but they were going to push this forward. And also, interestingly enough, as I've studied this out, there was, there was this practice that they did that if it... On the Jewish decision, the Jewish mindset was this, is if 100% of the people agreed you were being put to death, every one of them voted for death, then they actually would show mercy because they wanted to be more like God in the fact that they did not want a 100% death sentence passed down upon somebody. And yet it was that 100%, and verse number 64 says this, they said they all condemned him guilty. In that same thought process, they should have been able to give him and grant him mercy, and they did not. You see, all of this, we see in verse 64, they condemned him to be guilty of death. We say, wait a second, they broke all the rules. Wait a second, wait a second, this is very cruel. This is not, this is unfair. This is injustice at its best. It's unjust. It's cruel. They're not following rules. All of this, all of this is because they are in control of the situation. That's what they thought. But they were completely wrong. You see, they, they kind of came at this was like, we've got him. We are able to get rid of this problem. We're able to get rid of this one who is the one that's called the Messiah. We're able to get rid of this person who has called us out for our uh, hypocrisy. We're able to get rid of this one who's challenging us as the religious leaders. We can get rid of him now. doesn't matter how many laws we have to break. doesn't matter how many... Uh, 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 you know, rules we have to bend, how cruel or how unfair or how unjust it is. We want this to be done. We want it to be in our control. And we have got him. We have put him there. We will put him to death. We will make this happen. Before Pilate, we want you to crucify him is what they would later say. They thought they were in control. They thought that they were the ones who were making all of this happen. However, nothing could be further from the truth. I think about just the very prayer 
in the garden. If we just back up just a little bit in chapter 14, Jesus is basically even said at the Lord's Supper, he says, hey, listen, the, the time has now come. We need to go. And they go out to the Mount of Olives and they be able to uh, have that time of fellowship there. And then Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he, and he tells the disciples, I want you to pray. And he goes a little bit further. In verse number 33, it says that he began to be sore amazed or overwhelmed and to be very heavy. And he said that he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. It says he went forward a little and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. However, this is what he would go on to say. Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Listen, Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus knew that just in a few hours, that place is where exactly he would stand. He knew that he would be standing before Caiaphas. He knew he'd be surrounded by the high priest and the, his mob. He knew all of that. And in that moment that he's praying, he's, he knew what was coming. So for him to be there, he's saying, God, take that away. If it be your will, take that away. Let there, there be any other way, let it be. But nevertheless... I know your will, and let that be done. So as he's standing there, he knows this is God's will. This is my Father's will. This is what I've been sent there to do. I want, I want to make this statement that, that they thought they had came up with an outstanding plan to kill Jesus. But in reality, what has happened, Jesus is fulfilling the ultimate redemptive plan that God had laid out before the foundation of the world. This was the plan of God, not of Caiaphas, not of any other person in power at that time. This was God's plan for him to be there. It's, it's like, well, look what we did. And yet Jesus knew this is where I was supposed to be. Don't, don't, ever, don't ever mistake what's happening here as an egregious act of murder, though it was. Don't ever take this away from it that, oh, it just this poor man got sentenced to death and he died an unjustly death. And, and it was, he was sentenced to die for crimes he did not do. He was innocent. My friends, he understood that he was right where he had planned to be. Why was he praying that it would change? I believe there's a couple of reasons. One, I think it was that he knew that he was going to suffer the pain, just like you and I would have suffered if we went to the cross and died that day. But also he knew that in those moments, the sin that we placed upon him would hinder that relationship with him and his father. And it must have been so overwhelming for him. So he stands there in a place alone, surrounded by the enemy, in a place where he knew he was supposed to be doing this. But man, the feelings he felt. Here's the thing that we see, though, is that as he's being accused, he holds his peace. And I'm, I'm going to submit to us right now is that his actions coming forward could not be more selfless or clearly intentional. His actions here are, are selfless. They, they are him willingly laying down his life. It's, it's the fact that he, he's willingly doing this. It's clearly intentional. He, he is meant to be there at that time to redeem mankind. As he's being accused, he, he held his peace. And First Peter would say this in chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto we were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, he was not guilty, Neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. 
who in his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Understand this. Peter would later go on to write, being able to probably see it afar off, he'd heard some of the things that were happening. Here's what Peter would go on to write. He willingly stood there. They accused him. They reviled him. But he said nothing back, but committed himself to the will of God. Because he knew the one who knew no sin was going to take upon himself the sin of mankind. And that he says this, he would bear our sin in his own body. The one who knew no sin and would be that, that substitute for me. That substitute for you. That we would be dead to sin. And that he would take that sin upon himself. By his stripes we are healed. It was prophesied in Isaiah 53 verse 7 that he was going to be oppressed, uh, oppressed, that he would be afflicted, and yet he would not open his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He would go and not uh, be trying to defend himself. He would go willingly because he knew that he, the one who knew no sin was going to go die for those who were sinners. Finally, Caiaphas is so frustrated, they cannot get the witnesses to agree together. So the only way to get this thing moving forward is to get Jesus to admit something uh, aloud so everybody could hear it in front of many witnesses. And it would allow him to then usher in the verdict that they had already had on mind in a sentence of death. So Caiaphas finally asks, Art thou the Christ? the son of the blessed. Are you the son of God? And here's what Jesus, when he does open his mouth, he says, I am. <laughs> I know this is just two words. I am. But it brings my mind back to Exodus when Moses is about to be sent on that journey to go tell the children of Israel that they're that we're going to be free and we're going to follow God and and he's sitting there before that fiery bush the burning bush and and he says who am I supposed to say that even sent me and and God spoke to Moses very clearly and says tell them that I am has sent you I am that I am I'm the one who is sending you he said I am the one who's alpha and omega the beginning and the end I, I, I'm, I'm the one who's always been and always will be I am and when he says this I know that Jesus is not necessarily going back to that moment and comparing himself to that moment but he could here's what he's saying I am that same one I am the son of God I was there at those times. I'm the one who has been from beginning to end. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And just to keep this in our mind, remember that Jesus left the throne of heaven to come down to earth to live a life perfectly and to die for our sin. Just let me read to you what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because he was God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Once again, the chief priest, the high priest, none of them made this happen. It was being allowed willingly to happen. A perfect act of selflessness and clearly intentional that he was, from the very beginning, he was being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself, being obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. I want to stop right there before I read anymore because I want to go back to that statement, I am. Notice this, that this was already part of his plan. But there is nobody that can take the position of Jesus away. 
They could say, you're not the Son of God. They could say, you cannot be the Son of God. We will not recognize you as the Son of God. We will refuse to believe that you're the Son of God. But listen, nothing changes the fact that his position still is the Son of God who sits in the right hand of the Father. That's his position. Nobody can take that away from him. And when he says, I am the Son of the Blessed, I am the Son of God, he is declaring, I am that one that was prophesied to come. I am that one who is going to come and rule and reign. I am that one. I am. He left his throne in glory to come to this earth for you, for me. You see, the Philippians says that he left that all behind. He humbled himself. Came down as a servant. Lived this earth, on this earth perfectly, helping and ministering to people. And yet, here it is, he stands before a, a, a mob saying, you aren't him. I'm going to make this point here, and now I want you to listen clearly. Regardless of what you believe, or what you do not believe about Jesus... Nothing changes the fact he's the son of God. You can refuse, you can reject, you can willfully say there is no God, but it does not change the fact that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. The next thing that we see is that they could not take away his position, but they could also not take away his power. Now you would say in this moment he's powerless, but I would, I would go on to say that he is actually, actually ultimately Submissive to the will of God, but yet ultimately more powerful than ever. Look at this moment right here. He says, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Notice this is basically what he just said is I stand before you being judged by you, but there is going to come a day that you will stand before me and I will be your judge. Now notice this. He says, you think you've taken my power away, but I'm going to tell you this. I gave it up willingly at this time. I could call the angels right now. They would take you out. I could be free from this. I could just ascend back to heaven. I could disappear. I could do whatever I want to in this moment, but I am willingly and selflessly. I am I'm clearly intentional. I'm staying right here. Staying right here. But there's coming a day. Matter of fact, let me continue what it says in Philippians here. God's given him that name that's exalted above every name. And that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I'm telling you right now, I've already said this. You may not believe that there is a God. You may not believe in Jesus Christ, but it does not change the position that he is and who he was then and who he is now. And I'm also going to say this. You may deny him the power that he truly has, but I'm going to tell you there is coming a day. Every person in that courtroom, the chief priests included, the high priests, all those people were standing there condemning him. And he says, listen, there's coming a day that I'm going to come back in power and might and you will stand before me. And at that day, every knee will bow and you may not confess me now. You may not confess me later, but there's coming a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that day is coming. And he's saying, it's going to come when I come back in the heavens on a cloud. I'm going to come back and I will set up and I will rule and I will reign. And you'll have nothing to say about it. You know what's so interesting about this portion of scripture right here? Is they're condemning Jesus but he's not condemning them. You know, the Bible in, in John chapter 3 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But that next verse, so that Jesus Christ came into the world not to condemn the world, but that through him that the world might be saved. You see, he says that the condemnation of sin is already upon all mankind. 
but he has come to relieve them of that condemnation. Here they are, they're trying to put condemnation on Jesus, and yet he's standing looking at them and saying, what is about ready to happen? I know it's going to happen, but I'm going to go do it willingly because I want to even remove the condemnation from the sin that you all have. I want to remove it from you. That, that, that is the love of Jesus. To stand in a room full of accusers, condemning him to death, and yet he knows that he loves them and he's not condemning them. They're condemned in their sins, but he come to take away the sin of the world. So he came to seek and to save that which was lost. I think about all of that, and I say, my, my Jesus, he's so loving and caring. Now, I don't deserve it. And yet he gave it so willingly. He, he gave it in such a way that we cannot help but see that it was so much of a sacrifice but also it was intentional to save you and I from our sins. After Caiaphas heard this, he began to rent his clothes, which means he began to rip it apart. Now for other times in the Bible, you see that that is being done as an expression of humility or remorse over sin. But when the high priest did it, it was an expression of indignation towards somebody else's sin because he was angry at the sin that Jesus had just committed. Blasphemy. Comparing himself to the being God. Of course, we know it was the truth. And at this time, they begin to mistreat Jesus in verse number 65. They all shouted that he was guilty in verse 64. We don't need to hear any more witnesses condemning him to death. Verse 65, some began to spit on him. They spit on our Savior. They blindfolded him or covered his face. We don't know how they did it, but what they begin to do is to buffet him. They would, they would punch him. They would, they would beat him. They'd hit him. And it says even the servants did strike him with their, their palms of their hands. And, and so maybe they were smacking him like that or maybe even punching him. But here's what they would do. They would basically... As he's there, they would surround him. They'd come up and they, maybe it's just a group of them one by one, or maybe it's a mob coming down. They, they were punching and they were slapping him. And they were saying this, prophesy, who hit you? They were mocking him. Who hit you? You know, in that, in the, <laughs> when I think about that, Jesus being God in the flesh knew every single one of those men who struck him in the face. Whenever they hit him, they said, prophesy. He knew that person's name. And he knew that, that person, he was going to the cross to die for them. Unfair, unjust, but absolutely selfless and clearly intentional. He laid down his life for us. I think of how the fact that my sin does condemn me. Matter of fact, John chapter number 3, I just want to read this to you really quick. I don't have it in my notes, but John chapter 3 does say this. It says that as he says that for God sent not his son, verse number 17, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. You believe on Christ, that condemnation is removed. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the Holy Begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. The light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. I'm going to make this connection here. I believe that the people did not want to believe, those men there did not want to believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God because they knew their evil sin. They knew it. They felt guilty. They felt condemned by it. But here's what Jesus came to do, is to relieve them of that condemnation and give them freedom in Christ and salvation. I oftentimes think about how my sin debt that was upon me was taken by God as a substitution for my sin. He died and took it on himself. I think of verses like 
Romans 5, 6 through 11, where it says, For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement. Jesus died for you while you were yet sinners. While I was a sinner, he died for me because he loved me. I, I was a young child when I got saved. Whenever I came to Christ as my Savior, I, I was a young child. I was, I was 9, 10 years old. But I recognized I was a sinner and I needed Christ as my Savior. I didn't do a lot of horrible, bad, bad things. But sin, that sin dead, was still upon me. However, I've known a lot of people who say, hey, you know, I've done a lot of things in my past that I'm ashamed of. I've had addictions, I've been abusive, I've been, I've been a bad person. I don't know why God would want to forgive me. Why would God love me so much that he would willingly lay down his life? It's because he really did come to save you from that sin, to take it away from you and put it upon himself. See, your bad deeds do not make you a sinner. We were born that way. The Bible says that, that sin in the, garden of, uh, uh, with, in the garden with Adam and Eve, that was plunge all man into, into sin. Not because you're bad or bad deeds. So yeah, you may have done some things in the past you're not proud of. But that doesn't mean that's why you're a sinner. We were born that way. So Christ died for us that we could have salvation. But I still oftentimes think of all that condemnation I put on myself because of fact that I know I'm a sinner, that he died the death that he shouldn't have died, that I should have died that death. But here's what the Bible says, that Paul is saying in Romans chapter 7, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and things I don't do, I should do, and oh, wretched man that I am. And I don't know about you, but there's times that I feel that way. I don't, I don't, I don't deserve it. I'm a bad person. I, I really, I just, I'm not that good. But he goes on in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Listen, my friends, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this moment was clearly intentional. It was on purpose. It was selfless. All those things that we just were talking about, all that was because He loved you. And if you know Christ as your Savior, He died for you. What a time of rejoicing to, to praise the Lord for what He's done for us and know that He has forgiven me of my sin that because of the blood that was shed on Calvary, because He loved me so much that He would willingly stay there when He could have called the angels and He could have came and rescued Himself from that very moment when He was going to be willing to be spit upon and punched in the face and later on going to be beaten and crucified and die on a cross for our sins. He did that because He loved us. What a time for us to, leading into the time of Easter, to praise him for his sacrifice, to thank him, to give him the glory because we did not deserve that, but yet he died for our sins. I think of an old hymn that we may sing from time to time called Man of Sorrows. And it goes like this, Man of Sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, helpless, lost are we. Blameless Lamb of God was he. Sacrifice to set us free. Hallelujah. What a Savior. We have a wonderful Savior in Jesus Christ. Clearly intentional. Sacrificial. Selflessly. Stayed in this moment. Because it was the will of God. 
They could not take away the plan of God. They could not take away his purpose. They could not take away anything from his position to his power. The purpose of God was to come to die for sinners. And maybe this morning you say, I don't believe in Jesus. I'm going to say this. There'll come a day that you will bow before him. The Bible is clear. It said every knee will bow. That you say, well, you know, I, I'm not saved, and maybe, maybe later, maybe I, I don't need to know Jesus Christ today. That that's just a, a crutch. I'm going to tell you the thing that I've found in my life is that Jesus Christ is not a crutch. He is my bedrock of my faith and my existence. And without Him, I don't know where I'd be. I thank God for the day that I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. If you don't know him, I want you to understand he loves you very much. And he sent his son to die for you. He could have called the angels to come get him, but he stayed on the cross to die for your sins. This was not a mistake. This was not the manipulation of the court. This was nothing but the will of God for the plan to redeem you from your sin. You say, well, I'm a bad, bad man. I'm a bad, bad person. I, I don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. That's what grace is for. Unmerited favor. The grace of God that it comes down to all men. And it might be that you even say, well, I'm a good person. I've done a lot of good things. But the Bible also says this, that there's none righteous, no, not one. That it goes on to say that, hey, all your good deeds, they're, they're nothing compared to the what God has done for you in the sacrifice. All that means nothing when you stand before God. When you stand before God someday, you're not going to say, look at what I did to earn your favor what we're going to do is we're going to say thank you for what you've done and giving me salvation. There's nothing you can boast about in heaven for what you have done. Listen, my friend, no matter how bad you are, no matter how good you are, if you do not have a faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are condemned. And what I want to ask you to do today is to, to come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I, I believe that he is, even through this time right now, the word of God showing you that he loves you very much. He could be a personal God to you, a personal relationship you can have with him, a home in heaven, a, a security in knowing I am a child of God. And while you were a sinner, while you're a sinner, he's already died for you, giving you that way of salvation through grace. He loves you that much. Friend, if you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want to ask you today to come to know him. Reach out to us through Facebook. Reach out to us through a message. And, and just maybe if you have questions, let us know. We'd love to talk to you about coming to know Christ as your Savior. For those of you that are saved today, let's rejoice in the fact that he was clearly selfless and willingly laid down his life intentionally for us. I want to thank you for tuning in to this, this morning for our service. I'm praying for each of you. And I want to just take this moment right now to thank God for his son who came. Next week we will talk about the crucifixion. Next week we'll talk about that sacrifice. We want to thank him right now. They didn't stop. They didn't get out of that situation, but he willingly decided to go and fulfill God's plan for redemption. God, I thank you. Thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. God, I thank you that as a young boy, I came to realize I needed you as Savior. And Lord, I, I thank you so much for all those who through the years have been saved and those that are many years to come will be saved, all because of your work on the cross that day. Thank you for being so willingly to make that sacrifice where you came in and saved us from what is our condemnation, our our death sentence because of sin. But Lord, you came in and took that punishment for us that we could live free. God, I'm so overwhelmed by your goodness and your grace in my life. God, I don't deserve any of it. And yet, you stood condemned to die when it should have been me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Thank you so much for dying for my sin. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for watching. I hope the Lord spoke to your heart this morning. We really do want to encourage you that if, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, reach out to us, and we would love to talk to you about that. Calvary family, I've also included a video here from our missionary family, the Ray family in China. It gives an update on some of the things that they're doing there, some ministries that they're working on. Take time to watch it. Take time to pray for them. And I, at this time, I want to do something that is not something I'm comfortable with. But I want to challenge you as a church. Let's not forget that during this time that we cannot come to church, that we still have commitments to, to give, to help our missionaries like the Rays, and just the operations of the church day to day. This will be our second Sunday out of church. And of course, through that time, as we don't gather, offerings do not come in. But I want to just remember, that we're, we're supposed to be cheerful givers and to give of our tithes the first fruit of what God's given us. And I want to remind us each that God blesses us as we give. And God, God really does want us to think about the fact that as we give, He'll not just bless this person, but He'll bless this church. So we have some commitments to missionaries that we want to keep on fulfilling. If you would like to give, and I know some of you already have and want to, there, there are a couple ways that we're going to uh, have provided for you. you. You can come and drop it off by the church. That was one easy way. You can mail it into the church. You can call. We'll come pick it up. Another really easy way to do, and I, I, I've, I can, I've even did it today, that you could actually go to www.cbcelkcity.com. Scroll down just a little bit, and there'll be a place right there where you have a, a button you can click that you can go to a page that's completely secure, that you can enter in your information, and you can give to the church. And all that money is directly deposited into our church account. You can also indicate if you want it to be for general or missions. And so I want to encourage you that if you have the opportunity and you would like to still give, and that is an easy option for you, please go ahead and do that. And I know that the God will be blessing us for that in the time to come. And as I said, we just, it's not me begging, it's just us saying, hey, let's be obedient to the Word of God. And then also, we have commitments to our missionaries that I want us to be able to uphold. And I believe that's going to be just a reminder as we watch this video from the Ray family about how our work that we do here in giving to missions has a huge impact across the world, even in China, as the Rays are doing right there. So please watch this video. Be challenged by it to pray for them and also remember to give as God leads us to do so. Thank you. Enjoy this short video and tune in tonight at 6 o'clock for a short message. Xi'an, China, a city with thousands of years of history and with a population of over 12 million people, it's one of China's fastest growing cities. The central government has invested heavily in Xi'an and as a result we've seen an incredible boom both economically and population wise over the last five years. We have become the hub both educationally and economically of all of northwestern China. Located on the fertile Guanzhong Plain and seated in the northern foot of the Qingling Mountains, it's no wonder they called this place Chang'an, or City of Eternal Peace. It was to bring peace to the 13 Chinese dynasties that called it its capital, from the first unified China all the way through other notable dynasties like the Han, the Qin, the Tang Dynasty, all called Xi'an its capital. Just to put that into perspective for you, when David was king in Israel, Xi'an was the capital of China. When Jesus started his earthly ministry in Capernaum, Xi'an was the capital of China. The people of Xi'an are more traditionally minded than those of their Eastern Chinese counterparts. Though rich historically and culturally, there is a great dearth of the gospel here. Among the great missionary movements of the 18th and 19th centuries, much of China was exposed to the gospel. But because Xi'an was so centrally located, 
and so far from the eastern seaboard, it would take until the 20th century for the gospel to first arrive in the city. It would be Baptist missionaries that would bring the gospel to Xi'an, and it would take the Boxer Rebellion to open the city gates to allow them to come in. While Xi'an would be blessed with over 30 years of gospel light, through the turmoil, the revolution, and the eventual communist takeover, those fruitful years would come to an end. Today we see a thriving, booming, re-emerging city. Xi'an is reclaiming its position of importance in China. While the government continues to invest heavily in Xi'an to preserve its culture and to promote its economic growth, the city remains destitute spiritually. There is still a great need for the gospel light. My family moved to Xi'an in October of 2017. The Lord led us to partner with Pastor Xu and his family, a national pastor, to establish churches here in the city. After moving here, the Lord allowed us to establish Pillar Baptist Church on the west side of Xi'an. As far as we know, this is the only Baptist church in a city of over 12 million people. We are excited to be a part of God's work. The church is still small, but we're seeing the Lord work, and after over two years of laboring, we're seeing many people open up to our family and to the gospel. And we pray the Lord would do great things, not only in the city of Xi'an, but that we'd see many churches established all throughout northwestern China. We ask that you'd pray for us and even consider partnering with us as we do God's work here.